Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. It's great to meet you. I'm Joss. Uh, I'm a co-founder and CEO of Bedrock Energy. Uh, my background has been in startups for about the last decade. And during this time, I've mostly focused on startups that were venture backed on one hand, but on the other hand, had some kind of impact uh, orientation. So I've spent a good amount of time in sustainable agriculture, uh, some in urban mobility, and in all cases, it's been building technology that can have a demonstrable impact on how an enterprise business uh, operates either from a sustainability or an efficiency angle, um, or in some other way, ways able to have a positive impact on its stakeholders. Um, so uh, before that, I actually was in uh, more corporate strategy consulting, doing a lot of work in um, industrial private equity. And the reason I left was because for me, startups were just a better way to have uh, a positive um, impact that could change the way our economy or our society works. Um, so been in startups since then. And uh, when I wanted to start uh, my own business, I knew I wanted it to be in decarbonization. So related broadly to this question of the energy transition, energy resilience, um, and shifting from uh, kind of the energy paradigm we've had for the past century to something that is um, more sustainable for society um, and you know human and planetary health. And um, ended up meeting my now co-founder, who is a UT professor. Um, and so our team is very Austin heavy. And uh, we are building technology that makes geothermal a scalable asset class for cities and uh, the built environment to be carbon free um, so that we can breathe cleaner air and live in safer, um, safer buildings. So that's the overall gist. I am happy to go into any particular element Element that is of interest to this audience. What a wonderful way to kind of take control of not only your own career, but kind of like how you want to impact the world. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about geothermal and direct use geothermal? Uh, yes, definitely. And um, I know you mentioned that a number of the audience members that I see in, in this room are interested in just learning about um, uh, geothermal. So let me uh, screen share uh, a bit of a diagram that I actually used for an Energy Gigs webinar in March of this year. Um, let me know if this is showing right. So oftentimes when people think about geothermal, they think about what we see here on the right hand side, which is for power production. And what that means is that you go fairly deep or fairly hot in order to get really high temperatures above boiling so that you can create steam that then creates electricity. And so these little cartoons on the right-hand side, what you essentially see is, um, you know, uh, you're tapping into a deeper reservoir. That deeper reservoir comes up and is producing um, kind of power. Uh, and so that's kind of why you see these like smokestacks, um, because there's kind of like high, high temperature steam that is able to produce electricity. And so historically, what we're really familiar with is this middle one, hydrothermal power, which is what you see in the geysers in Northern California, what you see in Iceland. A lot of these are essentially volcanic locations. Um, so places in the world like Indonesia and New Zealand, where you get really, really high temperatures, you might get geysers the way we see in Yellowstone National Park uh, or in um, in um, Reykjavik uh, in Iceland, and um, uh, there's naturally really, really hot temperatures. What you there's a lot, a lot of um, uh, investment into is what you then see on the, um, the farther right-hand side, which is called enhanced geothermal systems, where there isn't existing, you know, hot water resources the way you have in Iceland or New Zealand, but there is still really hot um, temperatures deep, deep down in the earth. And so in places like Nevada, um, they are exploring ways that you can go deep, 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 like maybe 10,000 feet to the, to the depths that you might actually also be getting hydrocarbons and oil and gas. But instead what they're doing is stimulating the heat um, in some cases by like fracturing it um, and pumping fluid down so you can create hot water resources, create steam, and then go produce um, electricity from there. Um, so this is what is kind of more commonly thought of, geothermal power production, where you create electricity at a utility scale. But what actually Bedrock focuses on is the left-hand side, uh, which is direct use. And in direct use, you actually don't need to go quite as deep, 
but you can use shallower temperature gradients closer to the surface of the earth um, for either heating or cooling or both. Um, and in that case, you don't actually convert the heat into electricity. You directly use that heat gradient for heating and cooling where there's no conversion. Because if you produce power, you might need to, um, uh, you might have a bit of yield loss, uh, but with direct heating and cooling, you can directly kind of use the thermal energy exactly the way you want. Uh, so I can pause there if there's any questions. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, I have the question and answer box open and we also have the chat. Um, so how do you see this kind of changing the landscape of energy? How do you see it impacting us and kind of what's that that timeline? Absolutely. So uh, in terms of timeline, I'll answer that in a second, actually. So how does it impact, um, you know, our energy, uh, you know, our energy ecosystem? So a lot of what we, we say today is um, two, two things. One is energy transition and the second is energy addition. As a society, the amount of energy we need globally is just growing exponentially. And there's a few drivers to this. One is like economic development. The more people we bring out of poverty and into the middle class, the more energy we use as a society. The second thing is that the things we like to do as society are increasingly energy intensive. Think about AI computing and you know the amount of power that data centers now need to do more artificial intelligence and machine learning work is exponentially growing because we just need more computational power um, in the same way that society just needs more power for the other things that we like to do, like to travel or, you know, to, um, uh, to like live in bigger and more comfortable houses and, and things like that. And so broadly speaking, we just need to add more energy to um, our supply. And so what um, geothermal can do, geothermal of all kinds, is, is, is two things. The first is provide more energy into the supply. And that's what geothermal power production does. You know, how do we just get more utility scale power production into our grid? The second thing that geothermal can do is it actually provides on the direct use side efficiency. Because when you are using geothermal for direct use, you don't need as much electricity. Geothermal heating and cooling is the single most efficient way to heat and cool buildings. And so you can actually lower the overall energy use needed um, for the exact same outcome. So our summers are getting hotter, our winters are getting colder. How do you serve that heating and cooling load with less energy? Geothermal does that because it's just so, so, so efficient at what it does. And so if you can provide more supply into our energy, um, into our grid and into our energy, um, you know, uh, e ecosystem, and at the same time, lower the demand through efficiency, that is one of the ways that we can help support um, our growing energy demand as a, as a globe, as a society. Um, so that's kind of um, one way to frame it. Um, the other way to frame it is that as we get, um, as we kind of like get out of uh, you know, carbon emitting um, sources of energy, such as oil and gas, we do need those industries and we do need our power grid to have um, solutions that can meet the same need that oil and gas and hydrocarbons have done for human beings uh, for so many decades. And so uh, the other thing that geothermal can do is support that energy transition um, by shifting the energy mix away from hydrocarbons and into uh, cleaner cleaner sources um, of, of, of energy. So um, that's kind of the general transition trend. Um, the timeline, to answer the second part of your question, I would probably say that geothermal power production can really start to scale over, let's call it the next 15 to uh, 10 to 15 years, we'll start to see a lot more projects at large, large, you know, many gigawatt uh, scale. Um, in terms of geothermal heating and cooling, which has been around for a long time, our goal at Bedrock is to bring in the technology innovations that can help it scale in the, you know, two to five year time. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think every time I add another, well, I guess, Alexa or something like that. I'm like, I am using more energy, right? You know, like, and, and it adds, it makes my life easier, but I mean, it does kind of like increase the, the, the amount of energy we use. And I know we're in a very lucky place um, in America that we, we do have energy that we can rely on for pretty regularly. I mean, I know in Texas, we get a little, a lot of ERCOT warnings, especially over the summer <laughs> or winter. Um, but still, like every time I use chat GPT or something, I know it's gonna, 
you know, I have that power connected. Um, so it's just really interesting to see about how that works with the energy transition. And then I think it's because we are going to increase how much energy we use. We do it like every day, like every technology, like we add, there is kind of more of that load. Um, and so I would like to go a little more into kind of what bedrock, a little more detail about bedrock, but especially because you said that, I mean, the technology you're using, and I know, I mean, you're, you're based in Texas. So I assume you're trying to like implement it in Texas. And um, um, the fact that you're really trying to kind of speed up um, kind of some of that geothermal use, um, I'd love to know a little bit more. Absolutely. So we are based, um, we are doing a project right now in Austin, but let me step back and, and talk through, you know, what is the kind of geothermal and uh, that we are looking to scale up and what our technology does. So I'll screen share again. Yes. Um, let's see. All right, here we go. Um, so let me know if this is showing properly. Yes. All right, great. Uh, so essentially, the type of geothermal that we do focuses on the fact that buildings are heating, cooling for buildings is actually one of the largest drivers of carbon emissions, and it's a huge need for power demand. So as you mentioned, when uh, when ERCOT in Texas has challenges every summer, why is that? It's because every building in Texas is turning on the air conditioning uh, when it's 108 degrees, right? Um, so uh, moving to a more efficient and more carbon-free source of heating and cooling is a really, really key lever for um, broadly um, you know, fighting climate change and, and handling uh, the transition of cities to a uh, more resilient and secure and um, safe and healthy way to, uh, to, to power themselves. Um, so what geothermal does is, um, is it actually is just a heat pump, this kind of geothermal, it's just a heat pump, just kind of the same way an air conditioner is a heat pump. But what it does is that it pushes the heat in and out of the ground through what is called ground loops, um, are like geo loops, geo boards. And essentially, um, the reason this is so fantastic, and it actually can and typically does reduce your energy bill by about 50%, while also being totally carbon free, is because what the heat pump does is push heat or take heat out of the ambient temperature of the earth which is super, super neat. The Native Americans did a version of this. The ancient Egyptians and their pyramids did something like this. And the Romans also did a form of this. And, and the reason it's so powerful is that when, when it's 100 and let's call it 10 degrees outside in you know Houston, and you're running your air conditioner, you are putting the heat that's inside your building into the hot air outside. So you can kind of think about it logically. It's not the most efficient way to do air conditioning, but it's what we do as society like all over the world. And so you have what is called these urban heat island effects because we're basically putting hot air into hot air and cities do tend to be even hotter um, than you know green spaces. Even if you're just talking about a mile away, there's no, there's no difference except for the fact that in the cities, we're just producing a lot of heat and pushing it into the sky. Now, underground, it's actually a really, really ambient temperature. So it might be 110 degrees outside in the air in Houston, but underground, it is essentially 50 to 70 degrees in that first thousand feet of the earth. And the reason this is really great for heating and cooling is that if you actually put the heat into the ground and let the ground disperse the heat, um, then you get about two or three times more energy efficiency than if you're putting that heat into the air. And the same thing is true if you're trying to take heat out of the air for heating purposes during the winter, um, right? The air outside is 30 degrees and you're trying to heat your building. Well, you're not gonna get a lot of heat out of that 30 degrees or even colder uh, temperature outside, but the earth, again, still a very comfortable ambient 50 to 75 degrees. And so taking heat from that is a lot more efficient. And so that's why your energy bill comes down. Um, any questions on, on that element? Well, I love an energy bill coming down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and yeah, individual owners, homeowners or property owners love the energy bill come down. But you know who else really loves that coming down? Who else really loves that is the grid or caught. 
really needs to see stabilization. And so if you can have at scale communities and cities overall bringing their efficiency, uh, bringing up their efficiency and bringing the energy bill down, then your entire grid is more stable and less prone to these kind of like blackouts and um, and uh, power demand spikes that uh, are so common in the summer and in the winter now. Yeah, and we've seen that become more common. I mean, just the, this was a really hot summer um i'm really excited to see it waning a little bit um yeah. you know excited for the rain coming to houston um so what have been like some of the big challenges that you've had kind of starting bedrock getting some of this off the ground yeah um that's in a great question yeah ground. excuse me getting yeah, some of this in the ground, in the ground. <laughs> absolutely that's right that's exactly right um i think probably what is really challenging in building a hard tech company, hard tech being, you know, the, the cousin of soft software companies, is that in hard tech companies, you really need to bring together a really diverse set of people, right? I think I have built software companies in the past. And generally with software companies, you are able to hire from a set of people who have been at other software startups and they know exactly the playbook for building, um, you know, software as a service or exactly the playbook for building, um, you know, web applications. And with hard tech, that's not the case. You know, we're bringing from people who, we're bringing people in from uh, the real estate industry. We're bringing in people who come from oil and gas. A lot of our team comes from oil and gas, both on the technology development side, but also on the asset management side, and also on the field operations side. Folks whose experiences range from being in a lab and being a scientist, all the way to being in the oil field, in Saudi Arabia, in the Permian Basin. And the mentalities of these folks are just so, so diverse. And diversity is a really powerful thing because we couldn't build something as complex as Bedrock without that kind of, um, you know, multidisciplinary background. But on the other hand, it's really hard to get people who have really different mindsets to come together and understand why you're doing something, why your strategy is the way it is, why your objectives and key results that are set as quarterly goals are the way they are, just because everyone's background is so, so distinct. And so that Cultural translation has probably been um, one of the most challenging things about building a hard tech company. Um, and I'm sure there will be other challenges because our first project, we are literally drilling in the ground in urban areas. We have to be mindful of you know, gas pipelines. We have to be mindful of noise for tenants. We have to be mindful of power lines and water lines. And we're, we're building in the real world and that is so many magnitudes harder than what I've built before in software, where you don't need quite as much capital, where you don't have have nearly as much risk in order to get something out into the world. Yeah, um, that makes a lot of sense. So what are some of the ways, like what are some of the things that you've done? Sorry, um, if you don't <laughs> um, What are the things that you've done to kind of help take this diverse team to kind of gel and work together a little better? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I think a lot of it is just like time and investment into people um, to say, uh, you know, let me explain, um, you know, what we are doing, what is the context, why it is the case. Um, and it's just that like time investment and communication. But on the other hand, there's a reality that startups don't have that much time. And so I'm not sure how much of this audience, um, you know, spends, uh, you know, you know, is, is focused on startup entrepreneurship. But startups just have a pace of execution that is just the rule of the game. And so because we don't always have as much time as we want to just like slow it down and do an offsite and like explain, um, you know, it's it's also been. Um, it's also been a matter of like hiring and just like, how do you hire the kind of person who comes from oil and gas, but maybe has had startup experience or has been in a more scrappy environment where they don't have, um, you know, all the resources that the big energy majors have to throw at problems. And so it's kind of like, how do you mix and match people who might come from a certain really corporate or oil and gas background, but have a seed of that startup mentality or have had exposure to the kind of pace that we need to operate at in a startup um, in a startup world. 
Yeah, I could see that being a big challenge. Like, I mean, kind of you have a different resource mix, um, but then there's also some good things where you can go faster and you can kind of um, see change a little more easily and a little more quickly. That's um, the goal. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, I could see it how, I mean, and I like that you said kind of slow down the pace a little bit. So I think we have a couple questions coming in, but actually I have one more. Um, kind of like a point, do you have any, we do this a lot, right? Like, do you have any advice for your kind of past self? Like what are like a big, what's a big takeaway that you'd want to share if you could? Yeah. Um, for my past self, I think, I don't know where this audience is in their either entrepreneurship journey or startup journey. Um, but I think that, um, my past self was always thinking like, oh, I need to have a little bit more experience under my belt. I need to build a little bit more credibility. And it wasn't until I like, it wasn't until I really had an opportunity in my life to just be like, oh, uh, I have a pause. I can just take a sabbatical and go do research so that I realized, wow, a lot of people who are building companies that don't have more experience than I do, or even have way less experience. Um, and oftentimes I would see, wow, a lot of times these are men who don't feel as much need to build as much experience under their belt, but still felt the, the ability to go out and try their hand at building something or still had backers who are like, oh yeah, like you only have this many years of experience. You've only done this much in your career, but yeah, here's a few million dollars to go build something. And I think that wow moment was just like, you know what? I don't need to wait as long. And in fact, if I wait too long, I won't have the impact I want to have on the energy transition because you know, every single year it's just getting hotter and hotter. Every single year we're pumping more gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere. So like, why wait? Just like do it now. Um, and I think that was a really big epiphany that I had. And if I uh, had advice for my you know, younger self, it would be to like be a little bit bolder and be a little bit um, you know, more, um, I don't think the word is um, entitled, but certainly a little bit more confident um, to go have uh, the experiences and the impact that I, um, you know, dreamed about when I was younger. I think that's great advice. That's good advice for your past self and anyone's future self as well. Um, so one of the questions we have here from Heidi is, um, could you talk a bit more about your business model and what sectors of the market you're targeting, residential, commercial, or both? Yes. Um, so our business model is to uh, provide geothermal heating and cooling to a commercial real estate owner. And so the initial manifestation of that business model is what you might call a cash sale, um, which is you know, just like any other provider of a energy solution, we go to the owner and we say, you know, you could be getting your HVAC solution really conventionally, um, but then you'll have to pay all these fines because of, you know, the gas, um, the, the kind of carbon emissions, or you um, aren't able to meet your ESG goals. But instead, we can give you a geothermal heating and cooling solution that is carbon free and super, super efficient, and you'll save money and your property value will go up. And there's all these benefits to, to that. Um, all electric, super efficient option instead. The business model that we'd like to shift into over time is as we gather more data on the performance of these systems and as we basically improve the credit worthiness of these systems is to finance these systems and to um, provide energy as a service or geothermal energy, geothermal heating and cooling as a service to customers so that they don't have to pay that big upfront cost of installing, but instead they can pay nothing upfront and have us provide them heating and cooling as a service for lower than their utility bill used to be. And that is a model that is very similar to what you see in solar, um, right? People will sign up for a 25 year solar power purchase agreement or a PPA, and they don't pay anything upfront, but they're basically paying a certain amount every year for access to the system. Uh, so that's kind of how we think about it. Uh, we are focused on on commercial, and the reason is because um, we are developing some pretty sophisticated technology for drilling and uh, subsurface 
analytics and subsurface design. And because of the higher level of technology we're bringing to bear, it is more beneficial to use it for large commercial and industrial um, properties. And commercial could mean multi-residential, like a really large multi-residential apartment complex. But broadly, this just means bigger properties that are usually owned by institutional real estate owners, professional, um, uh, professional uh, real estate investors, um, because these, this is the segment that really is um, encountering big, big challenges in meeting these net zero goals. Like you look at these big corporate owners or these big in, um, investors and they're like, yes, we're going to hit net zero by 2040. And then you dig in a little bit more and they don't have a way that they're going to reach that. Um, so we are introducing geothermal heating and cooling as a more scalable method uh, for these um, owners to actually meet those very ambitious net zero goals. Awesome. So we have a couple more minutes and I want to make sure that we have a little more time for any more questions. Okay, we have. Um, so what about planned master communities for large scale builders? Yeah, so there's actually, um, and, and to be clear, geothermal heating and cooling is, it is a thing out there. A lot of um, military bases and, you know, museums and, and and fancy buildings like that already have it. And one of the projects that does already have geothermal is one in near Austin called Whisper Valley, and it is a planned master community. Um, I don't remember which builder is responsible for it, uh, but it does have geothermal in every single home in that community. And I think what's really cool is that when a few years ago, when um, that winter storm hit all of Texas, uh, that community, every single home maintained its heating, maintained its power because the efficiency of these geothermal heat pumps was so high um, that they were able to like, you know, keep everything very, very stable despite the fact that a lot of Texas was going, was losing power. So, um, so geothermal is very valid for planned master communities. We're also really interested in using our technology to make uh, geothermal even more viable for these kinds of communities because our ability to drill um, about three to four times faster than typical drillers, our ability to get more load out of a single bore, borehole, which basically means fewer boreholes and therefore less space required for the geothermal bore field construction. Um, all of our technology value proposition can absolutely help with planned master communities to, to get geothermal for an entire community. And, and some of that, sometimes that's called geothermal district systems where all these houses, all these buildings in a planned master community can actually be connected. And that improves your geothermal, uh, your efficiency even more because maybe one building is using a lot of heat, like it's the swimming complex for the planned community, and another building is putting out a lot of heat because it is the laundry facility or something like that, and you can actually take heat from one building and put it in another building in a in a kind of larger scale community. So uh, to Heidi's question, absolutely. That's super cool. Um, I, I kind of love how you, I mean, you're you're developing a couple different technologies to make this all work. Um, yes, a number yeah. of them. Yeah, so we have um, another question um, and I know we're at time. So if you, if it's okay, um, how do you split your time among fundraising, business development, day to day management of company operations? I mean, you do have a lot going on. So um, how do you kind of, wind up splitting your time and yeah managing. I think one really important thing is to only do what you need to do at the time you need to do it in um and so for example it like one big thing and, and Paul Graham of Y Combinator has a really good like essay on this is like do not fundraise and do not talk to investors if you do not need to be fundraising at that moment. Now, there's some like, you know, on the margins, like right now, I'm actually more focused on business development um, with people who are in real estate. And so I'll talk to an investor if I think that investor knows a lot of real estate owners. Um, but other than that, I try not to split my time. I try to say, if I'm not fundraising, I raised my seed round last year. I don't plan to raise a series A for another year or so. I'm just trying not to talk to investors right now. Um, and so then the question is, okay, among the things that you absolutely do have to do, uh, like I, you know, I do need to do business development right now and I do need to run day-to-day -day operations. A big piece that I um, have had to learn a lot of is delegation. And that's really hard because as a 
you know, I, I think maybe a lot of women in this room will be like maybe more perfectionist. Um, and, and, you know, you end up taking a lot of emotional burden, you take a lot of burden and you want to like, you know, help everybody and do everything the best you can. Uh, I had to spend a lot of time with my executive coach on how do I delegate better? How do I like let go a little bit more, trust other people to do it? It might not be exactly the way I do it, but still like just like create a team around me that is full of rock stars who I do feel confident delegating to. Um, so I think that's a really important thing. And I do hear often that it's a challenge that women often have because we're so often expected to like do more we're so often expected to kind of like handle the big things but also handle the small things and I think a big thing is just like no give the small things to somebody else yeah that can often be a little bit difficult but it is very important especially the more that you wind up scaling and everything and you, it's absolutely. like a constant reminder yeah, yeah. absolutely <laughs> it's very very true yeah. yeah what can I let go <laughs> yeah how do I let go? How do I trust? And how do I be okay with something that's not perfect? Yeah, great. Um, yeah, uh, that was Shell. And she said, thank you. And she's so happy to hear from you today. And um, I really appreciate that you took some of that time that you have, that little bit of time you have, and actually spent some time with us today as well. Of um, course. Yeah. yeah. I wish I could have heard the perspectives of the folks who are um, attending, but um, you know, overall, if if um, something related to innovation or entrepreneurship or just like doing your own thing is part of your journey, I'm super super glad that it's something you're considering. So we could always try and schedule like a follow up or something where we do kind of a a smaller group where we all get to kind of plan something that we could share together too. Um, so that's always an option because I'd love to hear. I, I mean, and I think our members would love to hear updates from you because um, it's it sounds you're building something really cool. So um, I I think like hopefully we can kind of keep everyone connected. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. And definitely please feel free to reach out on uh, LinkedIn.